they are they're mocking the civil rights movement. Everything, everything now is um, the civil rights movement. I believe health care is a civil right. The parallels between the struggle for civil rights and the fight to make quality, affordable health care accessible to all Americans are significant. This is a civil rights act of the 21st century. This is a civil rights act. We are going to restore the history, the true history, of the heroes of the civil rights because it's being distorted and used right now. Hello, America. Welcome to the Glenn Beck Program. I'm Judge Andrew Napolitano in for Glenn on this final day of our special week, a crash course in Beck. Monday, we brought you how America is being transformed economically. Tuesday, how radicals surrounding the president are helping him transform this country. Wednesday, you learned about the history that is being erased from our children's textbooks. Yesterday, we went over the White House and the progressive agenda to control the message and to control our free speech. And that brings us to today, the fifth and final installment, a special hour on civil rights and the rights of man. Tonight, we flew in a special guest to join us for this. You may know her. She's become a close friend of Glenn and of this program, Dr. Alveda King. Alveda it's so nice that you're here with us. Thank you, Judge. You know, my grandfather, Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., always said, make it plain. And I just want to thank you for bringing clarity to all of these subjects. It's just great to join you. Well, it's a pleasure to work with you, Alveda. Alveda is, of course, the pastoral associate at Priests for Life and the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Her father, A.D. King, was Martin Luther King's brother and a crucial contributor to the civil rights movement in his own right. If you were at the Restoring Honor rally on 828 in our nation's capital or saw some of the coverage, you might have seen her standing alongside Glenn to help us take our country back. We'll show you some of the footage of Dr. King from that spectacular day a little later. Also later, we're going to have Dr. King read a nonviolence pledge written by her uncle that can certainly still be used to combat much of the conflict we are facing today. But first, let's get going with this final crash course. As you know, one of Glenn's key goals this past year has been to restore history, and that includes restoring the true history of the civil rights movement. Scratching the surface of the civil rights movement, what is it? What was it? What is it really all about? Versus what progressives and radicals now want you to think it was all about. Individual rights individual rights. You have a right to be free. You have a, a right to live your life. You have a right to not be harassed. You have a, a right to your, your life and your liberty and your pursuit of happiness. That's what this country has always been about, but it has always been flawed, and we've never quite achieved it. Before we start going backwards, uh, let, let's, let's take a look at it again, what we're striving for. Let me show you how the movement in the 1960s has been perverted and distorted. You've got folks now like the Reverend Al Sharpton telling people that Martin Luther King's dream was really about redistribution of wealth. Here he is. Someone was saying to me the other day, Reverend Sharpton, we got an African-American president that we've achieved the dream of Dr. King. And I told him that was not Dr. King's dream. It's a great thing. I'm working with the president and supporting the president. But the dream was not to put one black family in the White House. The dream was to make everything equal in everybody's house. I, I don't remember that. Really? We also have the NAACP now telling um, everyone that King was a socialist. He said uh, the uh, NAACP came out, I don't know, this is about six months ago, saying that we, we wouldn't be celebrating Martin Luther King Day if we really knew who he was. Well, wait a minute. Hang on just a second. Uh, help clear this up. Listen closely to what the chairman of the NAACP recently said. 
we, we don't remember the king who was the critic of capitalism, who, who said to uh, Charles Fager when they were in jail together in Selma in 1965 that he thought uh, a modified form of socialism would be the best system for the United States. Uh, we don't remember the Martin Luther King who um, talked ceaselessly about taking care of the, the masses and not just dealing with the people at the top of the ladder. Uh, so we've anesthetized him. We've, we've made him into a different kind of person than he actually was in life. And it may be that that's one reason he's so celebrated today, because we, we celebrate a different kind of man than really existed. But he was a bit more radical, not, not terribly, terribly radical, but a bit more radical than we make him out to be today. Hey, is that true? Was he a socialist? Was he a communist? Who was the guy? Now we have King starting to be painted as a radical. You know what? King was a radical. And just as Jesus was a radical. Now we have SEIU, Andy Stern. Andy Stern doesn't think that Martin Luther King, the civil rights legend, really was the one that really helped create real change. In 2004, he told the Washington Post, quote, Pressure is needed to bring about real change. It was not enough to have Martin Luther King Jr. You needed Stokely Carmichael. Okay, so he's, he's saying now that Martin Luther King couldn't have accomplished what he did without people like Stokely, Carm, uh, Stokely Carmichael, who was the, honest, uh, the honorary prime minister of the Black Panther Party. So we have the Black Panthers being really responsible for real change. They got it done, according to Andy Stern, because of civil unrest. Carmichael was known, known for coining the term black power. So Stern thinks you need civil unrest to meet demands. I don't know when man decided that they could pit each other against each other to rule. It's wrong when any class, it is wrong when any color does it. Martin Luther King tried to get people to unite. Isn't that what we should be striving for? What do we unite on? We don't unite on color of skin because it's meaningless. We unite on character. It is our responsibility to protect the rights granted by God that, quite frankly, the founders fought for. Did they screw it up? Did they have it right? No. Has any man ever had it right? It's the, it's the same rights that Abraham Lincoln and blacks and whites fought for in the Civil War. Those are the same rights that King fought for. Dr. King, you appeared on that show following the monologue we just saw. We just heard Glenn talk about the twisted interpretation of the civil rights movement by some people. Was it your uncle's dream to redistribute wealth in this country? Well, actually, my uncle's dream, and, and I knew it so very clearly because I heard so many of his sermons and grew up in, his, in the same family where he was, but redistribution of wealth is almost it goes over to greed and selfishness with those who can have the most you know having the resources to do it but my uncle's dream and vision for all Americans with uh, you know life liberty and the pursuit of happiness everyone having uh, a comfortable place to live enough food to eat the ability to care for their children so that redistribution of wealth is just another whole different concept and even all the battles that he fought right. they were on behalf of all people was the civil rights movement of the 60s really just about race? Or do you agree with Glenn that it was about the human race? I so truly agree with Glenn. And my uncle talked about the American dream and everybody getting along as brothers and sisters. In order to be brothers and sisters, you can't be a part of separate races. There's no black race, white race, yellow race, and red race. But the human race and everyone learning to get together. My uncle said that we have to learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we'll perish as fools. People need to remember that. Okay, now let's go to another subject that I know you've spoken about with Glenn on this program. The difference between collective rights and individual rights. Collective rights and collective salvation is something President Obama talks about all the time. Let's watch a few clips, one of which you are in, and then I want to get your reaction. We talk about individual That's right. rights. God gives us individual rights. It's no collective salvation. It's no collective. Right. When people say, oh, it's human rights, that's not the same. That's right. 
explain the difference. It's inalienable rights. The, the belief of the founders, and those that came to America, they left Europe. Europe was into collective rights, collective issues, collective everything. They came to America. These guys said, no, it is individuals. It's you and God. That's why we established a freedom of conscience. It's not for the group. That's why one dissenting individual, a Quaker, can say, hey, I'm opposed to war. We say, okay, we let you, we let you off. I'm opposed to taking an oath. Okay, you can, you can just do an affirmation. Throughout, the, throughout American history, we allowed dissenters individually because of conscience. That's a one-on-one. -on -one. We did the same with freedom of religion. You have a right to practice your religion, not only as a group, but as an individual. All the way through, it was individuals. And what's so cool is it was preachers who did that. Those guys who came, I mean, the, the first constitution we ever have written in the history of the, of the country, 1638, the Reverend Thomas Hooker, who said, oh, wait a minute, God gave us a written word so that every one of us can go to his word and know exactly what he wants. We're going to do a written constitution so every one of you can go to the government and know what the contract is. Three years later, the Reverend Nathaniel Ward did the first written Bill of Rights. He said, wait a minute, we need to have a limitation so the government can't get into our individual rights. There is a huge difference between collective salvation and individual salvation. Individual salvation, you can be free and we can disagree with each other. Collective salvation, well then the policies of the government, oh, they, they start to become very, very bad because if you stand against the policies of the government and you are the oppressed that is in, in charge of the government, well, you can excuse all kinds of things. Barack Obama's view of salvation Here's where it comes from. Watch. And recognizing that my fate remained tied up with uh, their fates, that, uh, uh, that my individual salvation uh, is not going to uh, come about uh, without a collective salvation for the country. It's because you have an obligation to yourself. Because our individual salvation depends on collective salvation. The president has said over and over again in speeches at graduation speeches uh, on the campaign trail that all of our salvation is tied together um, which leads you right to reparations and everything else um, our salvation is tied together there is a collective salvation that depends uh, that our individual salvation is dependent on the collective salvation boy I know I haven't read that in the Bible mm -hmm. I know that is I mean that's not at all anything like what Jesus teaches. A, um, can you explain that? B, that leads to really awful things, does it not? It does. It's deception in that, say, a, a very generous person invites us all, thousands of us, to a big banquet and they prepare it. You're invited to the banquet, come collectively, everybody come. Now we all go, but if we don't sit down individually at our seat and eat our meal, you're not going to be able to eat my meal for me. He won't. I must partake of it myself. Or else I won't be able, you know, I went to the banquet, but I came away empty. I came away hungry. And I'll die because I'll starve because I did not take what had been individually prepared for me. That one meal is mine. And so that's the way about salvation. And it only comes from grace. You must sit at the, the table. Floor. You must partake. Isn't that, doesn't that lead you to, doesn't that, just that concept, understanding that concept, doesn't that show you that God is a God of merit? Yeah. I mean, he will prepare a banquet for each of us. He's prepared a mansion for each of us. He's given us the opportunity. We all, we may not be sitting, you know, next to all the special people or whatever, but we're still at the table, but it requires us to pick up we the fork. We have to pick up the fork. Well, you, you got to understand biblically, uh, the Bible says that all of us will have to stand before God and give an account individually. And he will measure our work as either wood, hay, or stubble. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you will not be able to stand in my stead for me. I have to stand right. in my stead be before him and give an account of my life. That's not collectivism. That's individual. That's right. And that's what I think is so, lost in our conversation. So, but what we're seeing, Glenn, is this, is that we're seeing a, an unholy mixture, a strange fire being added.